Hello and welcome to our video about the new features and brushes from Widget Designer version 6.1.3. The version itself has been already released a couple of days ago on September 15th. Uh, later I will make another video covering the new things from the upcoming version from Pimos Fox, uh, which we announced last week. Uh, so yes, stay tuned for this video. In the Widget Designer version 6.3, you will find new devices. The library devices that are supporting the LW2 protocol and two Barker devices, the Matrix Pro 2 and the Image Pro 2. So uh, with version 6.1, we introduced you to the new configuration dialog and we are continuing to add new devices to it. We also added new fidgets. You have access now to the servo fidgets, which allow interfacing with servo motors. We integrated two spatial fidgets, the IR fidget, and we have implemented a new way of dealing with those IR codes, meaning the way how you can learn uh, the codes, how you can store them and send them out again. Also, you will find new nodes for the fidgets. Um, so you can actually use the data in the node system. Um, and this entire point is covered by my colleague Janina. I will tell you later about the other new nodes, the Christie Spider, the Jog Shuttle and the Fader Extension input mode. The Jog Shuttle and Fader Extension were added as devices to the configuration within the last version. So with this version 6.3, you can now also use the data in the node system. Next, I will show you our new member to the widget family. There is a new display device called the Terra Display Array. And as the name already suggests, it connects to a Terra system, uh, the Terra controller that is, and allows you to monitor what's happening on a specific Terra display. Mm, so I will show you everything about this, how it looks like, what members they are, um, how you can change the look. Mm, so yeah. Let's have a look uh, what I can do with it. Lastly, uh, we will have a look at the new commands. There are some new ones. I will just give you a quick overview what they are and what they allow us to do. Um, yeah, so this is actually the only point that is available to you when you're using the free version of Fiji Designer. Um, as usual, you do not have access to any notes when you're using the free version. Uh, nor can you see the new devices, the Lightware and Barker devices, including the fidgets. Uh, yeah, and you cannot see or use the Terra Display Array. So let's get started and have a look what the Lightware and Barker devices allow us to do. I will just switch over to Widget Designer. So here we are. As all the other devices we have implemented so far, you can find them in the Devices menu. We have restructured this a little bit. Um, so if you're looking for the Phoenix, Spider or Terra devices, you can now find them in the Christie menu. So likewise, I can now click on the company's name Barco to find the Image Pro 2 and the Matrix Pro 2. I would just go ahead and click the first. Um, the configuration dialog opens automatically and the device has been added to it. All I have to do is type in the IP address here, click apply, and I will see that this icon over here is changing and I know that I am connected to my device. Also, I have now here the product type, um, which the, the device tells me, so that's also a nice feedback. To add the other one, I will just use the create menu in here so I'm going to create a Matrix Pro and also a Lightware. The Lightware is actually not a single device, as I mentioned before, um, but, well, let's say an entire device family. Uh, the company Lightware has developed their own protocol, Lightware protocol. Uh, one is called LW2. And pretty much all their video equipment offers this as an open connection per default. And we are simply using this. I will show you how this looks like later. The IP address from my device is 241. 
if I connect it, I see I have an 8 times 8 DVI matrix. So this could also be an HDMI matrix or anything else. So that's already it in the configuration dialog. Uh, actually, I will just quickly show you one more thing, the event listener. Uh, I can see here that all three devices, uh, each of them, have two events, um, a message receive and a is connected. So let's just add a, a label here and then I'm choosing in the light where, for the light where, uh, the message received event and in the scripting field I'm typing label one dot text equals message received. Uh, this parameter up here tells me it's actually a string, so I can simply put it into a label. And we will see in some minutes what that does. So I apply this now and I can close the configuration dialog. Now I would like to show you how easy I can communicate with these devices. Mm, so I'm choosing a custom script button for that and by double clicking on it I'm entering the item properties. And down here I can just type in the name from the device that I've just added to the configuration dialog and Script Assistant will directly offer me the devices. So I choose one, for example, uh, actually let's start with the Image Pro first, Image Pro 2, this one. Actually, it has uh, more members than the others. Um, here you see most of the common commands. Uh, capture logo, you can fade from or to black. You can freeze the image or get the input or the, um, the last message. Change the IP address, for example, lock the front panel, and so on. The test pattern one is a good example. Let's choose this with a double click. And now it already tells me in here what types of pattern I can choose. So let's say I want the color bars and I want to have a moving color bar. So I set this power to true. And that's already it. I can for example say here test or of course apply and click the button. As you've seen the members are not described in here. Uh, we are working on it. Uh, currently however you can find them in the manual that you can open with F1 or of course the online manual. The structure in here is the same. Uh, so you can find the information under Devices, Barco, uh, Image Pro 2 members, and here you can find all the members that were just offered by which designer. And the description is here. And you can see the example, how you can use one, how you can disable it or enable, fade from black, what kinds of parameters you can enter in here what this member actually does. Likewise, you can find the description for the members for the Matrix Pro and the Lightware device. As you see, the members uh, have the same name. So whether I have uh, this matrix or that one does not matter. You can find the same members for both. Let's have a look at the route member. Uh, I will uh, actually close the help file and enter the matrix name with a dot. I can enter road and here it asks me which source I want to route to which target. Let's take 3.2, so the third source to the second target. And in the same way I can enter the, uh, the Barker's name and choose road here too. Even though the parameters are called input and output, the structure is the same. So uh, again, 
I'm saying here I uh, would like to have the third input to the second output. So uh, this in fact enables you to, um, let's say in one job you have the lightware matrix and on the second one you have the Barkus one. But you want to use your same widget designer file. Uh, what you could do, um, let's say you have programmed for the lightware matrix. So all your programming is done with this one. Um, so in the configuration dialog, obviously you would then delete this one. Beforehand, uh, you could copy the name. And as soon as you have then added the Barker matrix, you could paste the lightware name in here. And all your programming will work in the same way, just that the device in the background has uh, exchanged. Um, Otherwise, uh, what you could do, of course, also is when you are adding the matrix, um, just rename it, uh, give it another name, a custom name, let's say matrix. And as soon as I'm now using the scripting language, I can now access the commands or the members uh, by simply entering the name matrix. So I will just reverse that change click apply and I would like to show you uh, one last thing about the event listener, uh, the message received event listener which we created before and how the custom commands work. So as you have seen the most common commands for the matrices uh, or the image pro 2 are already implemented. However, if you want to do a little uh, bit more advanced, um, you can have a look at the commands that are offered uh, by the protocol, for example, the LW2 protocol. So I have downloaded the manual for a matrix and here I see that the command S uh, would return me the serial number. So that's, let's try this in widget designer. Uh, I'm typing the lightware name again and choose custom command. Ah, let's actually close this so you see what's happening. Um, so it tells me it's a string and, and as all strings I want to enclose it with a double quote and now I simply type S and when I test this, the event listener that we've set up before in the configuration dialog noticed that the device actually just sent a message and displays it in the label. So here I see the requested serial number. Likewise, for example, I can also type commands like ipconfig equals um, and I will see here the IP address, the port, subnet mask uh, and the gateway. Yep, so you can just go ahead, download the device manual and have a look what other commands uh, would be handy for your uh, programming. So far, uh, the news about the new devices and the configuration dialog. My colleague Janina will tell you now everything what has changed regarding the fidgets. Thank you, Martina. Yes, we have a couple of new fidgets implemented. For uh, they are, it's the fidget IR, the servo fidget, and the two spatial fidgets. Let's start with the 333. So I can add that one, uh, get the serial number from the drop down, hit apply, and you can already see the values coming in. We have the acceleration in G, we have the gyroscope delivering values in degrees per second, we got the compass delivering a magnetic field strength in Gauss, and you also have the orientation the roll pitch and bearing value. I am not going to talk about the 300 fidget because that is basically the exact same thing as the 333. It only has the acceleration value. Okay, and the last parameter is the compass correction, which we are going to take a look at now. Magnetic fields change depending on the environment you are in, so when you are using the compass, it is advisable that you do an error correction. 
The Fidget website in the User Guides section provides you a magnetic error correction manual. Just go there and follow the steps you will find there. It's a complete guide. It tells you what to do when and where to get what. And in the end, you will find these 10 values, which you can just copy and add to Widget Designer. Simply paste them into the compass correction line, hit apply, and you're good. Now let's check out what you can actually do with your fidget. You can create an event listener and retrieve values, like from an action script node. The values it provides are the acceleration, the gyroscope and the compass values. What I find very interesting is the out of range, because that one means that the movement that you perform with the fidget is too much for the sensor to measure. So you can create something like a warning message. If you want to use the other values like acceleration or the gyroscope, keep in mind that these values are updating in a very short interval time. So this script is going to be really busy and firing continuously. We have something better for that. We got nodes now. So if you want to increase your performance a little, go to devices and take one of the fidget spatial input nodes. Simply enter the ID and use the node as you know it. Next, a little example project. So what I want to achieve is to somehow display the orientation of my fidget. So when I'm turning it around, my gauge is supposed to show how much I'm actually turning it around. What I need for that is, of course, the spatial one. And what I'm using is the gyro z-axis. So that one's giving me a speed of how much I am turning it around. You can see the value changing here. Next thing is um, I'm just multiplying it so I can scale it to the value I want to have in the end. Mine is between 0 and 100, so yeah, trial and error. As this is a speed we are using, I'm using the add relative node to just add the differences I had before and have a continuous movement. And the last of it, of course, the gauge output node. Pretty straightforward. All gyroscopes have something called a drift. So when values are drifting without the gyroscope actually moving, you can perform this little script, the zero gyroscope script, to level it and bring it back to zero. So if you see a drift, use this command, bring it back to zero and be happy. Let's check out the next feature, which is the fidget servo. A fidget servo is a little controller with which you can control either one, eight or 16 different little servo motors. For every single servo port you have, you need to add a new servo device. So it's always one motor per fidget device. I got one with eight ports and I connected my motor to port number two. Apply that. And there you go. Next thing, very important, the minimum and maximum pulse width. This is something you find in the data sheets of every single motor and it can be different for every single motor. The one I have has a minimum of 1100 and a maximum of 2000. Please make sure that you have the correct values here. If you have the wrong ones over time, you can actually break your motor. So, how do I use it? First of all, and very important, engaging the motor. If you want to use a motor, maybe a stepper or a servo motor, you need to engage it before you can actually use it. Specialty about the servos, though, is that you first have to set a position before you can engage it. If you do not have a position set, you cannot engage it and it's not going to work. So keep in mind, whenever you want to do it, use these two little scripts to set a position and engage the motor. I have put both the engage and the disengage script into this button. As you can see, it changes when I press it. This fidget also has an input node, the server input node. When you place it and you open it, you can see that it returns position and speed, velocity, and a couple of boolean if it's moving, if it's engaged, or if it's connected. You can see when I press it, it is engaged, true and false. So I am delivering the value of the position to a bar graph output node, 
and I have my script output node and I'm checking the engaged status to color and fill my label over here. And you can see engaged, disengaged, perfectly fine. Setting positions, we got two different approaches here. What I'm using is a fader value in a script. So I'm just using the move to position script for sending a value. But we now also have a node. So I can take the fader value directly with a fader input node. And in the output nodes and devices, you will find the fidget servo output node. And when you open the properties here, you can see that everything that you need can also be reached via nodes. So in principle, you wouldn't even have to use scripts. Okay, last but certainly not least, the fidget IR. This is a pretty simple one. Just connect it and you're done. And then comes the big magic, the code manager. This code manager manages all the different devices that you have connected. So select the device you want to control from the drop down and check out the code section. I'm now pressing the button on my remote control. There you go. And you see the infrared code appear. That's a hexadecimal code. The learn section over here contains all the other data besides the code that is necessary for interpreting the infrared codes that are received. Now check out something that you need to pay attention to. I am now pressing another button. You see the code changing in the code, but it's not changed in the learn section. If I press the button for a longer time, then the learn section changes as well. When my code is learned and updated properly, I want to store it somewhere. And this is going to be in an IR code table. I have already prepared two for the example later. Let me just create a new one. So this one is the IR code table number three. And it's as simple as just checking that your code is updated and pressing the plus button. Now I have added the current code. I can assign a name, like for example, shutter, because I'm using a nice little Christie projector remote control here. When I now press a different button on the remote control, I can also simply add that code with a plus symbol, assign a different name. This is going to be the zoom button and save that one. Now I'm pressing even another button, see the code change, and add that one as focus button. Okay, now I have three codes stored in my table, and all of the information that you can see here in the learn section is stored with those codes. When you want to check if the code you just received is the correct one, you can use the retransmit button. The fidget IR is not only a receiver for infrared codes, it also has infrared diodes with which you can send out commands. And now to the secret source, the code tables, which are not devices, but scripts like event listeners. This is the one that I just created with you. And as you can see, I have my shutter, my zoom and my focus codes listed here. For every single code I stored, I have a completely independent way of acting with it. I have my scripting field and I also have to check boxes if I want to be able to send and or receive this code. I can also script those. This can be handy sometimes. I do have for my script the complete parameter section over here with like the device name, the alias. And if I want to, for example, use a label to display the name of the code I just uh, hit on my remote control, I can simply use the alias parameter. I can now copy and paste the script into my other codes. And every time I hit a button on my remote control, you can see that the label on top is changing and it shows me which button is currently pressed. Now let me show you something important that you need to know when you are dealing with remote controls and infrared. See this parameter over here, the repeat count. This is a really important one. Let me show you in a debug message what exactly it is, what it does and why you need to pay attention to it. By the way, don't forget to hit apply every once in a while to store your scripts. Okay, let's open the debug logger and see what actually happens. And when I now hit the buttons on my remote control just once, you can see that I get values. If I keep it in pressed state, 
I get even more values. So the repeat count is the exact number of times that this code is repeatedly sent. 15 times in a row, or if I press it once, two times in a row. Okay, in this little example that I prepared, I have uh, the possibility to enter a pin over the numbers on my remote control to unlock this fader section over here. So I simply added this code table, numpad, and added the codes for every single number button on the remote control. And I added a script that just, well, just adds the numbers to the input box over here. The problem is now what I have shown you before. Every time I press one button, I've received the code twice. So now I need to use the repeat count to make sure that I execute my script only once. Let's check out what happens when I uncomment this and just use the add script over here. So copying the section over here, press apply. And whenever I press the one button on my remote control now, you can see that I add two ones because I received the code twice or even more times when I press longer. So if I want to make sure that my script is only executed once, no matter how long I press the button, I need this little if statement over here, checking for the repeat count. Now all the other keys are very simple. I learned the codes of all the number buttons on my remote control, gave them a proper alias. I did that for all the numbers up to nine and zero. And for convenience, I also added a backspace script for removing numbers. If you check out the input box, I am adding a couple of numbers with my remote control and I can remove them again with my remote control. In addition to that, I also added an exit button and an enter button for confirming the pin you entered and checking if it's a correct one. I decided on the pin that everyone has on their suitcase, one, two, three, four, five. And if I now use the remote control to enter those in my input box and press enter, I have unlocked my fader section. For controlling the fader section, I have added another code table with the arrow keys over here. And the script is really easy. If I press the up key, I'm going to add a little to my fader and for down, I'm subtracting a little. And the same goes for left and right. I'm just adding and subtracting when I'm pressing the keys. Okay, now when I'm finished playing around with the faders, I might want to lock that section again. That's what I added the exit button for over here. And when I press that button, I am unlocking the section again. There you go. And now, of course, I want to check if I enter the wrong pin and then I can add something like a little dialog box telling me Ooh, that was wrong. As I have mentioned before, this fidget IR cannot only receive infrared codes and can also send them to any kind of device. So if I want to send something, I can do that via scripting. When I use the fidgets IR object that I created, I have access to all its members. And of course, there is a send method over here. Script Assist already offers me all the available code tables. So I only need to pick one from the list, numpad, and then add the alias that I want to send. For example, the enter key. And the last parameter, the repeat count. Just to make sure that the device receives it, I'm going to send the command twice. So when I press the button, I'm going to send the enter code from my code table numpad, there it is stored, on my infrared device number one. The cool thing is now that I can use any command in any code table in every single infrared device I have connected. And I'm really flexible. I can even create my own libraries. And when I use the import feature, I can import them in any project that I want to without having to relearn everything. So as you know, told you, there are new nodes for some fidgets. I will show you now three other new nodes. Uh, let's start with the spider output node. The first step is to add it to the configuration. So I'm opening the devices menu, um, open the new menu Christie, and here I can find the spider. So I can create it. And if I had one connected right now, I would enter the IP address and click apply. For the demonstration right now, I left this empty and just take note that the ID is number one. So now I can close the dialog and in the notes menu under output devices, I can find this, the spider. 
And in the item properties, I can now enter the ID one from the configuration dialog. So if you have more than one spider device connected, uh, you would have more nodes and um, take the according ID for each. And then I'm entering the layer ID, uh, for example, also one, and I can choose now what I want to do with the layer, whether I want to only move it or only resize it, or whether I want to have relative or absolute movement. Next, I can either type in here constant numbers, or I can have an input or filter node that gives me numbers, and I could then select the source for the position or also for the, uh, the width. Regarding the height, I have several options. And down here, I can set the height, and this defines the aspect ratio, or the other way around. The aspect ratio can be set in two ways. I can either define a fixed ratio myself, or choose that the spider applies it automatically, depending on the loaded media. If you know the spider output node from the former versions, you might be missing the commands that were able to be sent with the um, old node. Uh, we have decided to make it like this, that the new node is actually, actually a real output node, which sends data uh, to the layer according to the connected nodes. And the commands are now available using the scripting language. This is just a reminder. I can now enter here spider to get access to the device. And by entering a dot, I access the members. And here you will find all the members or so something like fading the layer or moving it uh, moving it with one command once and not by constantly sending data through the node. Yeah, so here you'll find all the members. They are also described in the manual and um, yeah, that's been the news about the spider so far. Uh, there are also new nodes for the Jog Shuttle and a fader extension. Uh, we have re-implemented both boards with the uh, last version. Uh, so you might know that they are now also part of the configuration. And the settings look like this. Uh, here you can assign what happens when a fader is moved, whether you maybe want to control a parameter in Pandora's box, or you can enter in here which script should be executed when the button is pressed or released. With the version 6.1.3 now, it is also possible to use both devices, the Jog Shuttle and the Fader extension, with the node system. Uh, after they were added to the configuration, of course. Um, so let's open the nodes menu, input devices. Um, jog shuttle here, um, and this is the item properties. Uh, you can see here the fader value changing, um, and the button states obviously change from false to true if they are pressed. And if you want to use those values in the node system, just go ahead and connect this node to a filter or output node. And in the same way, I know it's uh, the fader extension can be added and gives you the same values, fader and button values. So far to the new nodes, so let's go ahead and have a look at the Terra display array. So let's get one more time back to the uh, configuration dialog. As you have seen with um, all the devices so far, the idea behind the configuration dialog is that you add devices here first in order to load all necessary parts for the communication in Widget Designer. Uh, so when you start Widget Designer, it loads only what is really necessary, which makes it much faster. So let's add a Terra device. As I mentioned uh, before, it can now be found in the Christie menu, Terra. We type in the IP address, click apply, uh, we are connected, and that's already it. The Terra display array can uh, be found in the widgets menu. 
under displays, turret display array. And with one click, we add it to our uh, project. In the item properties, double click, I can now add the Terra device that we just added to the configuration. And now I can choose the display array I want to monitor here. So I can simply click one and I see right away that it toggles the view and you see also some more information about the input. So the transmitter's name, the window number. And um, in fact, I have prepared a small example. Uh, so you see how it could look like a real project. Let me just toggle to my second page. So this display over here is uh, connected to the same Terra controller and I've chosen the display array called white. And with this button here, I am receiving the layout names uh, for the display array. And then I am uh, populating a this dropdown list here with those names. So here, if I press F8 for the run mode, I see here now my layout names and I can choose one and click the apply layout button back in the move mode. Uh, actually, this is old. We can delete it. Uh, so this button uh, applies the layout that's chosen with the drop down list and also labels the text with the name that I've chosen here. And the last button uh, simply clears the display array. So when I clear it, um, my widget over here shows me that there that the display array currently is empty. And when I apply another layout and apply it, I will see right away what my Terra display is now showing. So far to the widget itself. Uh, so let's get over to our last point on the list, the new commands. Of course, the Terra display array has some commands. Um, so if you simply type in WD Terra, you will get a list of all the possible commands you can execute. Uh, however, however, I would recommend to have a look at the members because there are more possibilities. So if you type in the name Terra Display Array 2 and a dot, you will get here a much larger list of things we can actually do. So in here you can see that we can change the colors from various things. And here we can set the title or um, for example, Uh, get return values, uh, which display array is chosen here. Um, yeah, so that's worth checking out. Next to the Terra display, there are also some more commands uh, for the input box, the tree view, and the drop down list uh, regarding the text color and the background color. So again, this is accessible via a global command. So we type WD dropdown list and scroll through the list to find the set and get uh, background color and text color. Or you can execute it via the member if you choose dropdown list one dot and then set background color, we can enter now an RGB values. So let's take uh, these values, um, for example, 120, uh, 150. And if you execute it, we will now have a different background color down here. Then there is a new command, uh, window focus is called. Uh, I have here just uh, created a new notepad window. Um, I haven't saved it. So the, uh, the window title up here uh, says untitled uh, minus notepad. So this is now the active 
application. Notice my cursor here is blinking. And as soon as I click in widget designer, this becomes my active application. Notepad has no cursor and the look has changed. So if I want to refocus Notepad, I can type in here window focus. And now I can type in here the title of the window. So in our case, it's um, untitled uh, notepad, um, closing the string. And if I execute it, you see now that notepad is uh, refocused. Um, so, my, uh, so it became the active application for window and keystrokes uh, would be sent to notepad now. The last new command is email send HTML. In all the versions before, we were only able to send plain emails. Um, and so with this HTML addition, you can now send HTML coded messages. So this is a very simple example here of HTML code. You can also copy it from the help file if you like. Just search the uh, command list and the email send HTML command. And so if you copy this, for example, to a string variable, email send HTML, you would then add the, um, the recipient from the email, the subject, and then the HTML code or your variable if you prepared it beforehand. Of course, you will still need to set up your email settings as usual. Um, yeah. So far, all the news um, about the new features and brushes from Vichy Designer version 6.13. Thank you for watching.